morning we're going to get started. We talked about, last time we talked about bonding in alkanes. Uh, we talked about bonding in alkenes. Those functional groups you're going to, we're going to learn actually in chapter two, so uh, chapter three. So today we, we are going to talk about bonding in al alkynes, which are carbon-carbon triple bonds. So we did carbon-carbon single bonds, carbon-hydrogen single bonds, carbon-carbon double bonds, and now we're going to talk about carbon-carbon triple bonds. Are there any questions before we get started? Anybody? All right. Okay. So we know from VSEPR that a carbon-carbon triple bond, um, each carbon is, um, has 180 degree bond angles. So each carbon has two groups. Those groups want to get as far away from each other as possible. So we have 180 degree bond angles. Um, we can use we can use S and P orbitals because things are at right angles to each other um, to describe the bonding and acetylene. But experimentally, if we do that, it's not, it's not going to match but with what we know about acetylene. So with acetylene or any carbon-carbon triple bonds, we are also going to hybridize. All right, so um, for carbon to bond to two atoms, so each carbon is bonded to two atoms, we're going to hybridize, we're going to take one S and one P. So we hybridize as many as we need. If carbon's making two bonds, then we hybridize an S and P and make two SP orbitals. So again, this is a hybridize, which is a very complicated mathematical process here to do this. We combine one S and two P's and we get two SP orbitals. In this case, uh, we're going to have two that are unhybridized. That's the PY and the PX. And just with that, just with the carbon-carbon double bond, we used the P orbital to um, make the pi bond. We're also going to use these P orbitals to make a pi bond. We're gonna, but it's a carbon-carbon triple bond has two pi bonds, so we're going to need two of them. So that's where we get our two um, unhybridized. P orbitals. So during this hybridization process, we start off with carbon in its ground state. We mathematically combine that to hybridize and we get um, two sp orbitals, a little bit lower in energy than um, the, the unhybridized p orbitals. So each of those orbitals gets one electron. So let's look at the, what that looks like on the next page. So here I have my sp carbon. Here's my sp carbon, 180 degree bond angles. And then let's draw in our, our, our py and our pz. So this would be, let's just draw that right here. That's our p. Y and then our PZ is in the Z axis which would really be coming out of your page so we could just kind of draw it like this. So we've got an orbital in each axis, each three dimensional axis. We have the SP and the X axis, we have the P and the Y, and then we have a P in the Z axis also. So that would be um, SP uh, carbon showing uh, exactly what SP carbon looks like. Uh, when we talk about the bonding in acetylene, we have two carbon carbon, we have a carbon carbon triple bond, so we're actually going to just put two of these together here. So I'm going to, I'll draw the, um, hybridized orbitals first and then we'll do the p orbitals. And we're going to kind of do this all together because if you try to copy it after it's all done, it's going to be pretty confusing looking. So here's sp and sp. So that would be the blue right here. And then I'm going to combine that with another carbon. That carbon is also sp hybridized. And then in acetylene, we have two carbon-hydrogen bonds. 
So let's go ahead and throw on our S orbital for the hydrogen and S orbital for the hydrogen and that's all my sigma bonds for acetylene. So here's a sigma here, this is a sigma bond and this is a sigma bond. All right, and so that's what we're going to be using to make the sigma bonds. We're using the hybrid orbitals and then we're using hydrogen uh, S orbitals to make those two carbon hydrogen bonds. Let's do now the, the pi bonds. So we'll, we'll do the PY first. Now we are drawing them so far apart that they wouldn't overlap and with just with the understanding that these are much closer together, close enough to um, overlap. It would just be a lot harder to draw and a lot harder to visualize. So that's my PY. And those PYs are going to do sideways overlap, which of course makes a um, pi bond. The PZ is a little bit more difficult to draw, so um, I'll do it. See, I'll do it this way. So the Z is actually, would be actually coming straight out of your page if we could have it do that. It's not, so I'm attempting to draw it sideways, but again, it would be coming straight out of your page if we had that capability of doing that. So that's our PZ. And we overlap the PZs. There's overlap on the top and the bottom and that's our second pi bond. So let's move that up a little bit. It's our second pi bond. Questions on bonding in um, acetylene, anybody? All right, so notice a triple bond consists of a one sigma and two pi bonds. So we have um, two pi bonds plus one sigma bond. That's equal to a triple bond. And we will see that with triple, triply bonded carbons when the two atoms are carbon and carbon making a triple bond. We'll also see that with other triple bonds. So uh, cyanide, for example, has a carbon nitrogen triple bond and we'll see the same thing with that. All right, so let's, let's now look at the bond lengths and bond angles in acetylene and compare them for what we saw with the carbon-carbon double bond and the carbon-carbon sigma bond. So this right here is a typo. This should be 1.06, by the way. So why don't you go ahead and fix that. Should be 1.06 rather than 8. So since we don't have all those pages in front of us, let's just write down the numbers that we get for compare with the carbon-carbon double bond. A hydrogen bonded to a, car a carbon that's part of a carbon-carbon double bond. That's uh, 1.08. Hydrogen bonded to a carbon that has a carbon-carbon single bond. That is 1.10. So this is stronger and shorter. So what we're going to find is shorter bonds are stronger bonds. So it's not a huge difference. We have 1.06 and then we go to 1.08 and then 1.10, but it is significantly shorter and that makes for a stronger bond. And then let's compare the actual carbon-carbon bond here. We have 1.20 uh, angstroms. Compare this. Carbon-carbon double bond. 1.33 angstroms and a carbon-carbon single bond, 1.54 angstroms. I don't want you to memorize these numbers. I just want you to see the trend that we see here. So the bond is getting um, shorter, right? This bond is getting shorter. That means it's going to get, it's also stronger. So stronger and shorter. than both. So I want you to know the trends. I'm very big on trends and this is an important trend to know. And we're going to come back to this point uh, at the end of the chapter. 
Uh, right now I want to talk about uh, bonding in a methyl cation and a methyl anion. So these are, these are um, intermediates that we're going to see a lot in organic chemistry. So we want to really understand the, the way that the type of bonding that we see in a carbocation and the type of bonding that we see in a carbanion. So here's our um, carbocation. And here's our carbanion. All right, so we're going to use VSEPR to predict the geometry. And so we have uh, three groups around carbon. Remember, groups are atoms or non bonding electrons. So lone pairs. So three groups. Therefore, trigonal planar. Arrangement of groups. Therefore, um, we're going to have sp2 hybridization. to make um, three bonds. SP2 hybridization to make three bonds. So what does a carbocation look like? What is the structure of a carbocation? This is going to become very, very important when we talk about chapter 7 and chapter 8 and in 51B. So let's draw the three bonds of carbon here with carbons bonded to three hydrogens. It does not have an octet. All one, two, three, four atoms are in the same plane. So here's the plane that contains all of those atoms. So that's the trigonal planar. Bond angles are going to be 120. So all four atoms in the same plane. We have um, 120 degree bond angles and we have our empty p orbital that's perpendicular to that plane. And that's exactly what we see when we have um, sp2 hybridized carbon. So this is actually empty. It's an empty p orbital. And so, so on the exam, I'm, I may ask you to label um, each bond, what type of bond it is and what orbitals overlap to make that bond. And so what I'm looking for, well, let's say I had an arrow pointing this bond. I'm looking for a sigma bond. That's the type of bond. And I'm looking for overlap of a 2sp3, I mean a 2sp2 and a 1s. Or you can say a carbon sp2 and a hydrogen s. So I'm going to give you the choice there. That's how we make that bond. So that's the type of bond and those are the orbitals that overlap to make that bond. Carbanion on, there, on the other hand um, is going to look a little different um, but the first thing we need to do before we, we try VSCPR is we need to make sure we have all the electrons accounted for. So we're allowed to draw structures without lone pairs, but when we're using VSCPR, we have to know if that um, atom has lone pairs. So does a carbanion have lone pairs? Has, a lone, has lone pairs. So uh, if we didn't realize that that carbon had a lone pair and we did VSCPR, we would get the same thing we get for a carbocation and that would be wrong. So you've got to make sure, first things first, um, account for the lone pair. So first thing, lone pair for a carbanion, always. So uh, and how would you know that? You're either going to memorize the chart, you will have worked enough problems doing um, 
formal charge that you know that a carbocation has a lone pair or you count electrons. So either memorize or count electrons. Let's count electrons. Uh, we have one carbon, that's four electrons. We have three hydrogens, that's three electrons. We have a negative charge, that's one electron. We add those up and we get eight, eight electrons. So if you um, distribute electrons around carbon, two, four, six, you see how we have to have the lone pair? So that is absolutely critical. You're going to get a lot of problems wrong if you don't realize that a, a carbanion has a lone pair. So if you get stuck and you forget what you've remembered, you can always go back to counting electrons to see if you have the right number. All right, so um, that's the first step. And after we do that, we can see that we have four groups around carbon. Therefore, we have a tetrahedral arrangement of groups. <coughs> and when we have tetrahedral atoms, they're sp3 hybridized. So a carbanion has a completely different structure than a carbocation. So let's draw the carbanion here. Tetrahedral arrangement of groups. Lone pair being one of the groups. What would we call the molecular shape here? Trigonal pyramidal or trigonal pyramid. That's what we would call that. The groups go tetrahedral, but Remember, the actual structure, we cannot see lone pairs when we look at this atom. Um, there's different ways you can do this. We can do crystal structures of certain compounds. When you do that, you cannot see lone pairs. So when we're asking for the shape, that's what we're looking for, what, what that looks like. So this is a, this is a carbana. We want to put, make sure that we don't forget the negative charge. And so now if I ask you to label orbital, la label what kind of uh, orbitals overlap to make each bond, let's, let's label this one. That is a sigma bond. Overlap of a carbon, sp3, and a hydrogen, s orbital. Let's just label it that way. Again, you can use the two. The two just refers to carbon being in the second row of the periodic table. So you could do it either way. And uh, the other thing we, we pay attention to in organic chemistry is what kind of orbital is that lone pair in? That lone pair is in an sp3 orbital. So I may ask you to tell me what type of orbital a lone pair is in. Okay, we'll see that increasingly as we continue throughout the year. Questions? Uh, do we also need to put a plus charge on the uh, carbocation? Yeah, we should. We left that off. See? I would have missed a point on the test if I did that. Okay. I may, I may want him grading for me, right? Because he's, he's tapped into that. Okay. More questions? Yes? We're going to talk about that coming up. There's a chart for us. So um, yeah, that's coming up. Actually on the very next page. Let's, let's do this. Let's talk about bonding in ammonia water and ammonia ion, and then we'll talk, we'll talk about that. All right, we can now describe the bonding in ammonia water and ammonia ion. These are things we're going to see in organic chemistry. So here's ammonia. Can you see that ammonia looks just like a carbanion in the way that it's and the way that it looks, the only difference here is we, got a, we, have, we have a lone pair in an sp3 orbital. We have, it's exactly the same. The only difference is the charge. This has no charge. This has a charge, okay? So, but it's, otherwise, it's exactly the same. So we have a lone pair in an sp3. 
We have our sigma bond. Overlap of, uh, let's do it this way this time. We'll do it, goes kind of go back and forth. 2sp3 and a 1s because you can label it both ways. And how do we know that? We know that because we have four groups. Therefore, um, we're going to make four sp3 orbitals. So we have sp3 hybridization whenever we have four groups. And again, molecular shape is trigonal pyrimid. All right, water also has four groups. So when we have four groups, we, we, we do sp3 hybridization. Why do we do sp3 hybridization with four groups? Um, because we want four orbitals to put those groups into. And so sp3 gives us four identical sp3 orbitals. So once again, we've got four groups here. Therefore, um, sp3 hybridization <laughs> molecular shape bent or angular both of those names are okay the lone pairs are in sp3s And this sigma bond is going to be the same as the sigma bond over here in ammonia. Um, we have an overlap. Well, oh, I forgot to label that. I'll do that at the end. Overlap of, um, in this case, it's an oxygen sp3 and a hydrogen s orbital. And it is a sigma bond. Did not leave enough room for that. That's a sigma bond there. Ammonia also has four groups. Ammonium ion also has four groups. When we have four groups, we have sp3 hybridization. Molecular shape, um, all of those groups are atoms, so this is a tetrahedral. <coughs> tetrahedral, or you can say tetrahedron, is also perfectly fine. We don't have any lone pairs here, but each of these nitrogen-hydrogen bonds is identical, and each is a sigma bond. Overlap of, and this time I'll use the two and the one, two sp3 and 1s. We'll just keep going back and forth. Both of those methods are perfectly fine for exams. Yes? So uh, the reason you do sp3 is because you want one orbital to each block, right? Each group, yes. Group. So does it benefit certain groups more than others if they're an s1 or a p1? s1 or a p1. An s orbital or a p orbital? So well, the, when, when we hybridize orbitals, we're only going to have hybrid orbitals or p orbitals. The hydrogen oh, okay. can't really hybridize. Yeah, okay? Yeah, so we can't, we don't hybridize hydrogen because it only has s orbitals, so yeah. Okay, so I've already had a question on this and you might have noticed that the number of groups corresponds to the number of atomic orbitals that must be hybridized to form the hybrid orbitals. So that's answering your question in this chart. So we have, um, if we have two groups around carbon, we use two orbitals, and to make two orbitals, we, we hybridize an S and a P to make um, two SP orbitals. If we have three groups, we need to make three bonds. We need to have three orbitals for those groups, so we're going to hybridize uh, uh, one S and two P to make three SP2 orbitals. If we have four groups, we have four SP3 orbitals, and that's going to be, this is always the case, so that makes it easy to remember. Um, let's talk about bonding and hydrogen halides. Questions before we do that? Anybody? 
questions? Yes. She asked whether it matters whether the unhybridized p orbital is on the y or the z. It really doesn't matter. I just was just doing that so you could picture it, but it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about bonding in hydrogen halides. SP3 hybridization can also be used to describe the bonding in hydrogen halides. So if we look at HF, we have uh, four groups, groups around fluorine. We know that by VSCPR, those groups want to get as far away from each other as possible. So they're going to get in a tetrahedral orientation. The electrons are going to get as far away from, uh, away from each other as possible. So there's going to be a tetrahedral arrangement of groups. tetrahedral arrangement of groups and F is fluorine is sp3 hybridized. And this is completely different than what you learned in GCAM. What you learned in GCAM is we can account for the bonding in hydrogen fluorine without hybridizing fluorine. And we can't see uh, non-bonding electrons anyway so we're going to assume that fluorine isn't hybridized because we can't see the we can't see the lone pairs. In organic chemistry, we say, wait a minute, those lone pairs still want to even though we can't see them, they want to get as far away from each other as possible. So fluorine is hybridized. So y you can take whatever view you want. I like the fact that I, no matter whether we can see them or not, the lone pairs do want to get as far away from each other as possible. So in this class. Fluorine is going to be sp3 hybridized. So that's, that's a, we do a couple things differently and that's one of them. So in GCAM, it it's the same for HCl, yeah. So this is always going to be the same for the halogens. In GCAM they say uh, it is not hybridized. Same goes for um, negatively charged oxygen. So any of those like that, we say that they're hybridized. And so this is what HF looks like, certainly for this class. The, the lone pairs are going to adopt a tetrahedral arrangement that's a little hard to draw because it's three-dimensional. But um, I'm attempting to look approximately three-dimensional. So this um, hydrogen fluorine bond, it's a sigma bond, and we have an overlap of a 2sp3 and a 1s. And all of the lone pairs are in sp3 orbitals. All right, so a little bit, we only do a couple things different. This is the difference number one. Um, compare bonding in HF and HCl. So hydrofluoric acid and hydrochloric acid. And let's look at that. So we know that um, chlorine is in, the third, is in the third row of the periodic table and fluorine is in the second row. Question? What would be the molecular shape? Uh, do we even name a shape? Linear, I guess. It's just linear. I guess it would be linear. Linear. We'll call it linear. Okay. All right. So we know that chlorine's in the third row of the periodic table. And as we move out from the first row to the second row to the third row, the orbitals get bigger. Makes sense. They're further from the nucleus, they get bigger. Uh, and so remember that orbital is the probability of finding an electron in that space. So if we're in the fifth row of the periodic table, it, the electrons are going to be much, much farther away from the nucleus. So um, I've tried to signify that here, show that this is a smaller orbital. So that fluorine is still um, sp3 hybridized, but, but we have a much larger orbital here. And so when we overlap with an s orbital, 
to make that a hydrogen fluorine bond or when we overlap with that S orbital here to make the chlorine hydrogen bond. Let's label that and then we'll talk about the difference here. So this overlap of a 1S with a 2SP3 of fluorine and over here overlap of a 1S with a 3SP3. And what you'll notice here with this fluorine is that we have greater electron density here. So that's the probability of finding that electron and if that electron is found in a smaller space then it's going to be more electron dense. Um, this one electron has a much wider uh, space to, to um, occupy so the electron density is spread over a larger area. All right, so uh, what, 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 did, what difference does that make when there's more, there's more electron density over here with um, hydrofluoric acid, more electron density in the region where the S and the 2SP3 overlap. Where the 1S and the 2SP3 orbitals overlap. Over here with um, hydrochloric acid there's less electron density. In the region where the 1S and the 3SP3 now because now we're in the third row of the periodic table and the 3SP3 orbitals overlap. What difference does that make? Well, the, the more electron density in that region the, the, you're going to have better overlap when we make this bond. So um, the, the, the area where we make that bond is where that S overlaps with that and in this region there's more electron density so more overlap means a stronger bond. Here um, we have much less electron density because that electron is spread over a much larger area so there's going to be uh, less overlap and that's going to make a weaker bond. So um, better overlap equals stronger bond. And you also can see bond length, can't you? If we have a larger orbital here, um, then this, this, this uh, hydrogen is going to be much farther than the nucleus than this hydrogen right here. So shorter bond and stronger bond, longer bond and weaker bond. So for both of those reasons, HF is stronger and shorter. And that's important because a lot of times we have a hard time breaking a, a hydrogen fluorine bond in this class. We're not going to be using fluorine too much. We're going to use, be using hydrochloric acid, uh, hydrobromic, hydroiodic acid, much more than hydrofluoric acid. So HCl is, HCl bond is weaker and longer. Questions? Anybody? Yes? Uh, sometimes you use 1S go with 2SP3 and sometimes you use 1S go with 3SP3. How do you decide the number of uh, the SP3? Okay, so her question is how do we decide why was this a 2 and why was this a 3? 
because uh, chlorine's in the third row of the periodic table, so we just go right over here. Right? So um, carbon's always going to be two, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, second row, chlorine, third row. So if we make uh, hydrobromic acid here, that's going to be 4sp3. And um, iodine, hydroiodic acid, 5sp3. Everybody clear on that? I do. That's a really common question. I'm glad you asked that. So that's, that's where we, that comes from. So um, hydroiodic acid is going to be even weaker, right? Really long bond, really weak bond. Okay, so the chart for that is on the next page. By the way, if you are wondering where we're supposed to do an eye clicker today, we're going to do it on Friday. Okay, so next time bring your eye clickers. And I like to do it like kind of in midway in between class. Like right now you guys are probably just like, okay, I'm done. And it's nice to take a little break in the middle, so that's what we're going to be doing on Friday. All right, so um, here's a chart that kind of talks about what we were, we were kind of explaining this chart here, and now we can see that bond length is getting longer. That makes good sense. These orbitals are bigger, so the bond length is longer. And if the bond length is longer, the bond strength is weaker. So we actually have a really weak bond here with a hydrogen and an iodine. Compare that, that's 71 kcals per mole. Compare that with a hydrogen fluorine bond, 136 kcals per mole. So that the actual data is consistent with our sort of our prediction here and our explanation why that should be. This result can be generalized. Bond length increases and bond strength decreases with increasing atomic size as you descend any column in the periodic table. Okay, so that's an important trend that you need to know for this class. All right. What happens across a row, a period in the periodic table? All right, and I forgot to bring my slide that shows this. Um, atomic size decreases, remember that from GCAM? We'll show the slide in chapter two. Uh, atomic size decreases, therefore, what's going to happen to the bond lengths and bond strengths? Length decreases, strength decreases. Yeah, the bonds are going to get stronger as we go across. They're going to get shorter and stronger. Therefore, the bonds should get shorter and stronger. So let's see what happens. Carbon hydrogen, bond length 1.091. Hydrogen nitrogen, um, shorter bond length, exactly what we predict. Hydrogen oxygen, shorter bond length, e shorter even still for hydrogen fluorine. What happens to the bond strength? It's getting stronger. Isn't it nice when our predictions turn out to be exactly what you get? And that's exactly what you get. So notice the change is not as dramatic as you move across a row. These changes are not as dramatic here. We go from 119 to 136. Here we go from 103 to 136. Why is that? Um, and that's the slide I want to show you. Um, if you look at the size of atoms in the periodic table, as you go across, the size changes um, kind of gradually. It's not a very big change. As you go down, the size changes dramatically. And so since the size changes dramatically as you go down here, then you would expect that's going to have a bigger effect, and it absolutely does. Okay? So um, again, I'll show you that slide in chapter two, but a really dramatic difference as we go down. So the size is really, really changing a lot, and that's why we see a bigger effect here. All right, so let's write that down. Size changes only gradually. As you move to the right, down a column, sign size changes dramatically. All right, so a, a, really, a really important trend to know for this class. 
Let's talk about relative bond length and bond strength of the bonds in ethane, ethylene, and acetylene. We were already kind of looking at that as we were talking about each. So let's see that summarized in a chart. All right, so we see carbon-carbon single bond, carbon-carbon double bond, carbon-carbon triple bond. Hybridization, sp3 of those carbons, sp2, sp. Bond angles, 109.5, 120, 180. So, so far so good. That kind of summarizes everything that we've talked about. Length of the carbon-carbon bond, 1.54, 1.33, 1.2. So the bond length is getting smaller. We have, a small, we have a smaller bond length. What's happening to the strength of the carbon-carbon bond? Whoa, it's getting growing dramatically stronger, isn't it? Um, length of the carbon-hydrogen bond. So one of these guys bonded to this, this um, triple bond is also getting shorter and it's also getting stronger. So exactly everything we talked about. So, uh, as, so, so as we can see summarizing here, the length of the carbon-carbon bond, as it gets shorter, it gets stronger. And the same factor here with this carbon-hydrogen bond. We'll talk a little bit more about why this is. We haven't really just talked about that. We'll talk about why this is coming up. Um, important points here, a double bond, sigma plus pi, uh, is stronger than a single bond, but not twice as strong. All right, so when we have a double bond, we have a sigma plus a pi. So if it's not double, then, a, then that means that a pi bond must be weaker. Than a sigma bond. And I think we already mentioned that last time. Didn't we say the overlap's not as good? Yeah, when you have a pi bond, the overlap is not as good as when you have a sigma bond, so it's going to be weaker. And so that's why that is. Why? Sideways overlap, not very good. It's good, it's good enough, but it's not as strong as a sigma bond. Sideways overlap is not as good as end-on overlap. And on overlap is what you get when you make a sigma bond. Whether you're making a sigma bond from an sp3 orbital or a p orbital in it, it doesn't matter. It's end on bonding. The more s character a hybrid orbital has, the closer to the nucleus and the more tightly held are its electrons. So that's really this ex explanation here. So what does that mean? And what does s character mean? So compare here. We know what an S orbital looks like. We know what a P orbital looks like. Would you agree if the nucleus is right here and the nucleus is right here that the S orbitals on average are closer to the nucleus, right? P orbitals are on average. Most of the density is pretty far away from the nucleus here on this side and on this side. So electrons are closer to the nucleus in an S orbital. So let's label this. This is S, this is P. Electrons closer to the nucleus. Here, we can see on average the electrons are further from the nucleus, and in fact, there's a node at the nucleus. So with both of those factors, um, electrons uh, on average are farther away from the nucleus. Why does that matter? Electrons are held more tightly the closer they are to the nucleus. We did the analogy where you take two magnets of course, magnets are north and south, but we can think of them as plus and minus. And if you hold them far apart, you don't feel any attraction. If they're strong magnets, you get here and you start to feel this sort of force field, right, that wants to pull them together. 
the closer you get, the stronger that feel is. If you've never had played with magnets before, I'll bring some next time and you can see what I'm talking about. When you get re really close here, you can feel how strongly those magnets want to pull together. So it's the same thing with the positively charged nucleus and the electrons. The closer the electrons, the more strongly they're held. So what does that have to do with um, S character? Well, if we have an SP3, We, see, we, we combine one S and three P's and we say that it has one-fourth or 25 percent S character. So when we combine one S and three P's, the orbital that we create, which is an SP3, is going to take on the character of what's been used to combine it. And so uh, an SP3 is going to look more like a P orbital than an S orbital because it only has, it has three P's for every one S. So 25% S character. SP2 is one third or 33% S character. SP, one half or 50%. S character. More S character? Electrons are closer to the nucleus. And therefore they're going to form stronger and shorter bonds. So when you have sp carbon versus sp3, the electrons are closer to the nucleus and so it's as if carbon is more electronegative. It has a stronger pull on those electrons. Okay, so it's as if an sp carbon is more electronegative. So that's going to pull the electrons closer, that's going to shorten and strengthen the bond. What does that look like? Um, I have these drawn here. So this is an sp, an sp2 and an sp3. So you see the difference here? We've got, we've got three P's and one S combining, so it's going to look more like a P. This lobe is going to be fatter. This is uh, two P's and one S, so this lobe, okay, it's, looking, it's getting closer to the nucleus because it's got more S character. This one here is uh, half, one, one S and one P. So this lobe is, is, is shorter, rounder, closer to the nucleus. The nucleus is right here at that node. So if you make a bond, say with a hydrogen here, that's going to be a shorter and stronger bond. Okay, so that's real important. We're going to use that in chapter two to talk about acidity and basicity. So um, sp3, carbon hydrogen. Bond, longer and weaker. because there is less S character. And at the other extreme with SP carbon, it's going to make bonds that are stronger and shorter. And that's because the um, sp orbital is closer to the nucleus. Because uh, in an sp orbital, electrons are closer to the nucleus. And so that's the reason why a carbon-hydrogen sigma bond is shorter than, stronger than a carbon-carbon um, uh, sigma bond. So uh, sp3 and an S overlap, right, for a carbon-hydrogen. Here we have a carbon-carbon is uh, sp3 and sp3. S orbitals closer to the nucleus.
so therefore this is going to be a shorter and stronger bond. So now it makes sense, this column that we really couldn't explain before, I'll put this right up, you don't need to turn to this, but now this column makes a lot more sense why um, a hydrogen bonded to an sp3 carbon is going to be longer and weaker. Okay, we'll stop right there and we will continue this next time.